to the Changelog episode 0.5.3. I'm Adam Stokowiak. And I'm Wynn Netherland. This is the Changelog. We cover what's fresh and new in the world of open source. If you found us on iTunes, we're also on the web at thechangelog.com. We're also up on GitHub. Head to github.com slash explore. You'll find some training repos, some feature repos from the blog, as well as our audio podcasts. If you're on Twitter, follow Changelog Show and me, Adam Stack. And I'm Penguin, P-E-N-G-W-I-N-N. Join for a special roundup episode by Mr. Nathan Smith, a.k.a. the 960 Dude. <sighs> Nathan, why don't you introduce yourself for the three people out there that don't know who you are. Hey, guys. Um, I'm back again because Wynn wanted me to be on the show. Not Adam. So I am. <laughs> oh, and Adam. So thanks for having me. Cool. You've got some uh, new codes to talk about since the last time you were on the change log. So last time we talked about... The 960 CSS grid system. Now you're out with Formalize at formalize.me is the URL. What's this all about? Oh, uh, yeah, I kind of alluded to that. I was, it was in progress last time we talked, but it wasn't launched yet. Um, basically, it's as close as you can get to like a form reset. So rather than try to make the forms look crazy different or replace anything on the fly with JavaScript, creating accessibility issues, it just tries to take the elements that are there and make them look as close to as close to the default that you can that all the browsers will uh, kind of agree on, you know. So, it's, you know, at a glance, it's not supposed to stand out necessarily. It's just supposed to look at it and say, yeah, it looks like a form. So <laughs> that's pretty much it. But, I mean, it's uh, there's quite a bit of code involved, but, um, you know, it's it's an accessible approach. So, so what's the idea here? So that the forms look exactly the same in all browsers or just enough? As close as humanly possible without resorting to, like, hiding elements, and uh, creating fake elements with JavaScript. So what's the deal with browsers and forms anyway? I mean, is this a, an operating system uh, affinity that it, they have, or is it more just a, each browser has its own way of displaying form elements? Honestly, it's kind of like Seinfeld says, who are the ad wizards that came up with that one? <laughs> I would love to sit down with whoever decided you know, on all these different browsers that we're going to go a different way than the operating system or, or whatever. I mean, Chrome on OS X looks totally different than Chrome on Windows or Chrome on uh, Ubuntu or, you know, Linux or whatever. Um, same with, like, Firefox and stuff. So, I mean, they try to keep to the operating system default, but they're even different amongst themselves within the same operating system. So Formalize is a, an attempt to get them as close as possible to one another. So 960 is pure CSS, but on Formalize, you've got uh, JS library support for Dojo, MooTools, Cincha, jQuery, Prototype, even YUI. So what's the JavaScript component here? Um, it's just a little, um, what do you call it, polyfill that will add HTML5 form support to browsers that don't have it natively. So if you're in like IE6 or IE7, um, the autofocus attribute will work, the placeholder attribute will work. Stuff like that. So, um, and it, you know, it does a check first to see if those already work in the browser, and if so, it leaves them alone. So you get the the browser native handling. Have you seen the exhaustive uh, HTML5 cross browser polyfills on the modernizer repo up on GitHub? I have. Those are pretty cool. Um, for this, I just wanted to do pretty much the styling, and then the um, the small polyfills were were low hanging enough fruit. You know, just the the autofill and, uh, or sorry, autofocus and uh, placeholder and that type of thing. So, I mean, because a lot of those already exist, I didn't want to attempt to just recreate the wheel there, but what I couldn't find was something that made form elements look kind of default-ish across the browser spectrum. What sort of feedback are you getting on Formalize from the community? Um, seems to be pretty well received. Actually, I had a guy call me at 10:30 last night that wanted to talk about it, so I. That's always fun. Wasn't sure how he got my e- email or. Uh, um, Your Aaron, home sorry, phone wasn't, number. Wasn't yeah. Sorry, wasn't sure how he got my home phone number. I should say. So I was like, uh, really love to talk to you about that, but if you send me an email, it'd be a lot better, because you know when you got a kid, you don't want to be talking web at like 10:30 at night. So. Yep. Talking to web at 10.30 at night, so uh, this is not something you normally do with uh, your wife, is talk web? I mean, I'll chat with people, but I mean, it's, it's a whole other thing to have a phone conversation with somebody that doesn't even introduce themselves. <laughs> Just immediately pick up the phone, hey, did you do Formalize? Yes. Cool, um, I have a few questions. Who are you? You know, a little weird. 
Well, you were telling me the other day that uh, you went out to dinner with your wife and she didn't want to talk HTML5, uh, JavaScript, or CSS3. Right. So, you know, I, I said I could frame it as uh, food, clothing, and shelter, but, you know, that didn't go over <laughs> too well. <laughs> well, looking at the demo, you actually have quite a bit of different uh, camp support. You got Dojo, you got jQuery, MooTools. Seems you've uh, put demonstrations up in each one. What was involved in that? Uh, initially, I did it in jQuery. Then I had uh, somebody kind of volunteer with a pull request for MooTools, and I thought, well, if there's somebody wanting to do it for MooTools, there's probably a chance that they want it for other libraries too. So I went ahead and did the Dojo prototype in Yahoo ones because I was already familiar with those. And then uh, another another guy uh, volunteered to do the Sencha one, or the, um, I guess it's EXTJS. So, yeah, uh, basically I didn't want... Um, people to look at it and say, oh, this is cool, but oh, I can't use it because we've already standardized on a library that it doesn't support. So I'm going to ask the number one question probably on everybody's mind is that uh, you're a recent SAS support, or a SAS convert, but this is in CSS. Right. Uh, well, it actually comes with a um, like underscore formalized.sas file that you can use if you want. So, Boom. boom. Just like so that. So boom. So boom. Yep. So what's a, what's a CSS to SAS convert look like these days? Uh, pretty much like a web developer. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I guess the last time on the show you asked me about SAS and I hadn't really used it, so my answer was like, yeah, it seems good. Um, my initial response to Win was get off my lawn, you know. <laughs> I remember that. But, uh, you know, I've been using it since uh, starting this new job at HP, and we use it as a team. So kind of like, you know, you jump on the project and it's already it's already in, in the project, so you kind of run with it and... I really thought I would miss the curly braces and even was wondering, like, oh, man, is this going to ruin me for real CSS? But I think, you know, after a certain point, you realize CSS is not so complex that it's going to kill your understanding of the language itself. So beyond just killing CSS, what about things like uh, CSS3 support, the, like, round of corners, the things that actually take up, like, uh, eight lines to support all browsers? Oh, yeah, I mean, not having to type, like, dash webkit, dash moz, and all the permutations is awesome. How much time do you think you've saved? Uh, I mean, not I just know. time, I mean, but also just brain cycles. Yeah, I think too. At the end of the day, you haven't, you know, you're not typing all that stuff over and over. So, I mean, probably saving on like metacarpal. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's I can't, you know, quantify the exact amount of time, but I certainly feel more productive using SAS. I kind of hear this song in the background. Do you hear that? It's a whole new world. <laughs> Going back to Aladdin, is that where you're going with hey, that? Hey, dude, you put the movie things out there all the time, so I, I pull one out of the, out I the just cuff. like, probably so I'm cracked up at your choice of movies. It's like children's cartoons and things. That's great. I keep it simple, you know. You know, what's funny is, you know, I love the, the indented syntax of SAS, and, you know, the SESS syntax still supports the, the curly braces, but, you know, um, we both prefer the, uh, the indented syntax, the original SAS syntax. But what's funny is, you know, I prefer the indented white space in SAS, but yet, you know, I prefer Ruby over Python. But uh, just to prove there is a yin and yang to the universe, it seems like I'm giving all the curly braces back in my mustache templates. I, I love mustache as a templating language. You guys used it? No. No. I have not. However, <sighs> so much to teach you guys. Since Wynn likes it, I have the feeling I'll be using it on a project <laughs> in the future very soon absolutely dude <laughs> well the good thing about sas really is that it's uh it's so easily converted from one to the other so you can pick a camp if you want um like for me i got a couple extensions out there that i actually deploy uh, i write the sas but i have a rake task to convert it to scss before i actually ship the gem so it's available to, to both camps i'm agnostic huh to me just as an end user i mean it sounds like you prefer sas too but um, you know, I thought I would like SCSS, but once I got into it, it's like, if you're going to go different, go all out, you know, and save that typing. I don't know. It just seems more logical. Oh, yeah, to... totally. I'm with you. But the, the point really with that is that you've got uh, people who are scared of SAS as like, oh, I've got to change things. Just like the, the comment for you had at first, too. But if they're just a CSS player, they can easily just use that SAS or the, sorry, the SCSS because it's basically CSS. I mean, you could just drop CSS right in that file and it runs. No problem. I guess what I like about SAS is when you go into a SAS file, you know that you're in a SAS file. You don't have to look and say, okay, are there any variables being used in here? Aside from, I mean, obviously looking at the file extension, but um seems a little more straightforward to me. 
You know, one of the things that uh, you liked when we chose the intensive syntax for the project we're working on is the uh, one less decision to make around how do I format my my style sheets? Because with the intensive syntax, there's really only one way to to arrange your your style sheet code with the uh, CSS traditional um, syntax. You know, you, everybody's got their own opinions. Oh, yeah, I mean, it keeps the one-line CSS riffraff out. <laughs> well, not right. only that, but I mean, not to jump on the sister project of SAS, but Hamill does the same thing for HTML. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've got to the end of a file, you know, ERB or HTML file, and you see close div, 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 and you're like, <laughs> what? Well, okay, I know somewhere something's unclosed, but I don't know what it is. You haven't felt it the best unless you've actually dealt with a uh, with a conflict with Git, and you've got a massive ERB file or straight up HTML file, and try to work your way out of that. What's worse is when one of the closing did tags, the missing ones are down on a partial somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. On the flip side, sometimes I'm like, I really just want to do a data dash attribute. Is that so hard? <laughs> As with any abstraction, it seems like the yeah, the the simple things are what become hard, you know, with abstractions that make uh, the incredibly hard things very simple. Yeah, I think there's trade-offs either way, but I, I, I mean, I prefer Hamel if it's on a project already. Um, I, I would probably say that I, you know, that's the old saying or whatever, came for the Hamel, stayed for the SAS. Except I came for the SAS and Hamel, I'll take or leave. Kind of mm. like, meh, I like it, but I, I wouldn't like, you know, cry if it wasn't in a project. If but I would cry instead. if there was no SAS, that's for sure. I might shed a tear. I would definitely shed a tear. With so much SAS talk, I know that we're a little lighter on the uh, listenership so far because there were some <laughs> uh, some comments in the Convor room the other night about uh, someone saying, if I hear Hamill and SAS one more time on the changelog, I'm going to shoot myself in the face. So Uh-oh. our condolences to your families. Um, <laughs> let's do a roundup show, shall we? Let's, let's, uh, let's kick it off. Who's first? And this is totally unscripted. Obviously. So, Adam, what would you like to talk about first? I think just kind of continuing down the whole style framework, let's talk about HSL. So before this uh, conversation, I kind of got a little bit of a, a brain teaser from Wynn about what HSL is. And Nathan, I guess you kind of backed me up with not really sh- being sure about where this fits in. Right, yeah. Initially, I was like, so wait, I know RGB is like a numerical equivalent of hex, but what is HSL? Right, so we got Brandon Mathis picking up the uh, the cool domain hslpicker.com, and he threw up a very snazzy, very beautiful site to demonstrate uh, a lot of, I guess, some SAS in the behind, because I know that he's a SAS dude, and then some nifty JavaScript, but uh, win, HSL, what is it, bud? For those that don't know, HSL is hue, saturation, and either lightness or luminosity, depending on your flavor. Um, basically, it's the three dimensions that I think how the human brain works around picking colors. Because normally, when you sit down to uh, to pick a color, um, you start playing with those RGB sliders, and you're like, "What the heck?" And then you flip over if you're on uh, Mac, you flip over to those crayons, <laughs> and you pick the one that's closest just yep. by the crayon color. That's right. <laughs> so, but HSL, give it a look. Uh, basically, you have three sliders. The first one's the hue, so it goes from red to red. So you can choose, you know, red through the oranges, the colors of the rainbow, all the way to meets red on the other side. The second one is the uh, saturation. So the zero saturation is uh, totally grayscale, and 100% saturation has the full color component of the color. And then the third dimension there is the luminosity or the lightness. And so you can go darker or lighter. So that's usually how a designer, when we sit down to, to pick colors for a design, you want something that's a little warmer or something's a little darker, uh, something's a little more washed out, you know, those types of scenarios. So this is a, a good way to pick those. And for those of you who know Brandon Mathis from, I think it was 0.1.1. Fancy buttons. Yeah, not only fancy buttons, but also the kind of... Um, file-based blogging what was it called the what was that show called octopress oh no his not his project but uh what was that show about like the oh open source publishing okay so yeah he's got that cool octopress kind of uh fork of jekyll which is snazzy because it kind of jumps out of the box with the and octopress cool is cool but yeah. i will out brandon he ioned me the other night and said he was taking a serious look at nesta Ooh. nesta cms oh of course why wouldn't he of course those links will be in the show notes up next is, uh, I guess, Reveal, which is a jQuery modal for HTML5 and data attributes. Now, I haven't had, actually had a lot of um, experience with these data attributes yet, but I've been meaning to. 
So we've got an expert on the show. Mr. Nathan Smith, tell us what data attributes are. So in the past, um, uh, you know, you would have um, a tag and you would want to store just a little bit of information. And so you, if it was a link, you could abuse the rel attribute, even though you weren't really describing what you're linking to. You just have like a dead link with a pound and you say rel equals triggers modal or whatever. So I think, uh, you know, the the HTML working group, they realized that people were yearning. There's this deep yearning in the hearts of web developers for some custom attribute. So for that, you have data dash and then whatever. So you could say like data dash filling equals and say peanut butter jelly, and that's valid because you have data dash at the beginning. So um, uh, recently Dojo 1.6 came out, and they used to have like, you would say, you know, tag name div, dojo, widget, equals, and then whatever. And now instead they say data dash, and they have those type of things kind of prefixed with data um, to make it valid HTML5. So why data dash and not just using the attributes that no namespacing? Uh, I think it just makes it easier on the browser to um, know that they're all kind of living off the same thing. Um, and eventually with JavaScript, like, it's not implemented um, cross browser, but eventually you'll be able to say like, you know, have your element and say dot data dot whatever the dash is after that. So let's say you have data dash peanut butter dash jelly, you could say data dot peanut butter dot jelly, and that would return you the value of whatever is inside that the quoted attribute value. So that'd be cool because it's kind of object oriented uh, way to store little data snippets. And this modal is from Zurb. It's 100% buzzword compliant because it's jQuery, HTML5, and has data attributes. But Zurb does some awesome work. If you haven't checked out their designs, they've got a, a nice little sandbox up at zurb.com where they show a lot of their CSS tricks. It's actually funny you posted this one too because like the, the day before you posted this, I was like, wow, this is awesome. Oh, actually, I posted this one because I saw you watched it on okay. GitHub. Okay, <laughs> okay, nice. And I watched it because I was like, i got a blog about this, and you beat me to it, which is awesome. I'm going to switch gears and talk about Rawler. Have you guys seen Rawler? I have not. I have not. Did we actually hear about this from our friends over on the Ruby show? Did we really? Yeah. About two or three episodes ago, maybe four. I'm happy to give a shout out. Holla. <laughs> so Rawler basically is a way to crawl your website and find broken links. So it's a gem you install, gem install Rawler. Um, it's got a nice command line interface, but you basically basically say Rawler and give it a URL. And there in the, um, the blog post, I give it the changelog.com and uh, it starts crawling our website. Looking for 404s. Luckily, we didn't find any. Got a lot of uh, 301s, just the way that uh, Tumblr works. But it's a nice way to, to crawl your website looking for broken links. This is actually quite good news, actually, to probably any one or two SEOs that listen to this because... I can imagine becoming into a project and wanting to know, like, tell me about, tell me about my site. You know, spider this thing, give me a gist of, like, past links and have some, you know, kind of calendar data against what was spidered and what was found and what was um, not. Yeah, I mean, because when you're content farming, you want to make sure that your, your crops are well watered, right? Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of uh, Hala even, you guys seen Mahalo? Boom. With the uh, content farm rules change over Google's doing to those guys? It's like a 20% layoff. That's the suck. Yeah, so basically people were getting used to and even getting down to a science being able to game Google's algorithm. They recently had an update to it, which uh, pushed a lot of those content farms off the first page and you know, subsequently dropped all their revenue from ads and whatnot. Would you classify ehow.com in that category? Uh... <laughs> I'd say about.com ranks above them, but even that's kind of questionable, so yeah. <laughs> when you see, you know, how-to articles on um, you know, how to beat a nicotine addiction, I guess that one's semi-useful. I saw one article that was talking about content farms and it linked to one that was like, how to make friends at college. It was like, <laughs> step one, go meet people. Like, really? <laughs> step two, don't just stay in your dorm room. Like, uh, how's that an article? Be interesting to see how the uh, change in the Google index changes the uh, the web. You know, because you know Google's index, I think, is slanted towards folks like us. It's amazing how you can put in um, just an ordinary word that happens to be a, a GitHub repo, and that that repo's at least in the top three. It's pretty good on medical terms too. But yeah, every everyday ordinary search is kind of hit or miss. Did you guys see Inception? 
I did. I actually saw it three times in the theater. Three times in the theater. I think the first time that I saw it was on a four-inch screen. <laughs> we'll have to put that in the show notes to explain that that weird noise. So I had to watch it again when I got home, and then um, you know check out the uh, the repo that we posted on the change log. This one was uber popular. Inception, the movie, explained in C code. This was from our friend Steve Klabnik. I actually had saw this when it came out. It came out, um, I guess, last summer. Um, I hadn't seen the movie, so it wasn't that interesting to me at that point. But after I saw the movie, it's it's crazy. But um, came out on DVD, and Steve posted this, and 181 retweets on this deal. It's just crazy popular. For those that don't know, it's basically the plot of the movie written in C. We uh, we also had a version of this in in JavaScript, right, Nathan? Uh, yeah, there's a gist out there we can put in the show notes. Basically, um, uh, and I think that's where we discovered uh, console.group, which is pretty For cool. Firebug? Uh, yeah, so in Firebug and I'm, uh, you know, WebKit Inspector and so forth, you can not only say console.log, but you can say console.group, and then every subsequent console.log will roll up under that group. So what this guy had done was had several console.groups, one representing each dream level, and then gone all the way down you know, to the undefined dream space uh, and, you know, and then bubbled all the way back up. So it's a pretty cool example. Um, it's a good way, I guess, to teach people that know about the movie how to read JavaScript and or vice versa. <laughs> I was kind of disappointed at the bottom. It didn't have a little token, though. A yeah. totem. Well. Totem, is that what they're called? Yeah. Totem. Like the uh, the Beer Fest 2011 site. What was the URL to that? I'll put it in the show notes. I'll have to find that one. But that was a, for a party at South by Southwest. Um, yeah, it was done by Alex Guyron of uh, CSS Beauty and uh, N Clued, N C L U D dot com. Um, made really good uh, use of CSS3 animation. So as you scrolled, it zoomed in further and further and further. And if you went all the way down, there was a little spinning top totem. And we clicked it, zoom all the way back out and say uh, Beer by Southwest or something to that effect with a little sound effect we've seen that effect in opening title sequences for movies for for years i wonder if this is going to be something that if it's just a novelty if this is going to be of use in any sort of application scenario the the zoom into the app interface we shall stay tuned compass magic we can't get away from SAS, especially since uh nathan is on board so compass magic extends SAS with the power of image magic did you guys see this one uh, I remember you mentioning it. Well, it's built on R Magic and Image Magic. Those are the two standard tools. If you're slinging the Ruby and want to do anything with Image Magic, um, Compass Magic, um, you know, Compass supports out of the box CSS gradients, but not all browsers support them. So this one will actually build static images based on the same linear gradient syntax and just compile images on the fly, so you can just ship those images with your CSS code, and they work in any browser. That is awesome. It's pretty nifty. So who wrote this? This is from... I knew you were going to ask that. Let me click the link. Stan Angeloff. Angeloff. Not uh, Ashkenaz? Not Jeremy Ashkenaz. Not this one. There's at least three repos in the changelog that are not Jeremy Ashkenaz's. <laughs> this is actually really cool because um, a lot of times I catch myself in this scenario without this just putting a background color being lazy or you know, going in the extra stretch of actually doing the grading if I really want to be nice to the browsers who don't support it. You know, on a, all it's doing is providing mix-ins, right? So you can still mix and match those standard compass mix-ins for the linear gradient, but just also supply... A uh, magic, M A G G I C K namespace to mix in above that one, so that for older browsers it would pick that up. So basically, it outputs like a PNG, which is immediately redeclared as a CSS uh, three gradient, so that if the browser doesn't understand that CSS three gradient, it already has in its mental model of how to paint it um, to use the background image instead. Exactly. Nice. It's a nice little syntax, too. So the example that uh, we listed here on the, on the blog is magic erase blue, which sets a default background color for whatever you're painting there, and then a linear gradient. You supply your color stops, and then set your left and uh, right corners. It will actually draw rounded corner images for you. So I guess next up we had jQuery Mobile Alpha 3, which is the Pow Pow. 
Say what? Have you played with this one? I have a little bit. Too? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, what I like is that it takes you know the look and feel of I guess several different mobile uh, OSs, and it tries to kind of hit a sweet spot of looking good within each one without trying to look native. Um, and I guess the the logic there. I mean, I, I haven't talk to the jQuery mobile team directly about why they chose that way, but I think it's kind of cool because then, let's say, like, there's an iOS update that changes the way buttons look or, or the way, you know, a particular background on a, on a type of page looks. That way you're not scrambling to try to update every time because you have your own look and feel for your app. It's, um, you know, it looks, it looks um, tasteful, yet it's not uh, trying to go one-to-one with the OS that it's in. You know, the thing that struck me over the Alpha 2 release that was prior to this is just the, the amount of speed. So the, the Alpha 2, as you would scroll even on the iPhone 4, which is you know, quite a beefy mobile device, you would see the checkerboard transparent background underneath the document for you know a ways down the page while it was trying to paint the document. And this mm-hmm. one seems a lot, lot zippier. Yeah, I know they've been working a lot on speed and responsiveness. It's got to be a big problem to build a mobile framework that spans the amount of devices that they're looking to support with uh, a single code base. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a large undertaking. I heard uh, John Rezig on, a, on another podcast. I can't remember which one, but... Um, you listen to other podcasts? I know, right? Um, but, I mean, I always check this one first, <laughs> and then I double-check. And then if nothing else is posted on the changelog, then I go listen to other podcasts. Good deal. But anyways, John Rezig had said, uh, you know, he's talking about the expense that would go into testing on every uh, mobile mobile OS and how many phones you'd have to buy. And the interviewer was saying, oh, wow, so how do you guys do it? And he said, we, we buy a bunch of mobile phones and test on every OS. You know, like, they, there's no real way around it in his, in his mind. He was saying that that's something that jQuery Mobile tries to do so that you as a web developer don't have to, to go and, you know, incur that cost yourself. They shoulder the burden for you, huh? Yep. So how does this change the markup? Uh, yeah, there's a little. I mean, there's somewhat generated markup. Um, you know, back to data attributes, buddy. Boom. That's right. Uh, yeah. So they have you know the data dash attribute, um, making generous use of that to mark which uh, DOM elements need to be styled by jQuery Mobile. Uh, what's kind of cool though is because uh, most, I'd say all mobile browsers, all good ones anyways, understand that. Uh, the uh, what's it called attribute selector, so you can use that and not have to worry about browsers like IE6 not understanding that, and so it's something that you can sprinkle in your markup and, and know that it's just going to work. Speaking of jQuery, you just got back from uh, DrupalCon, gave a jQuery talk up there, right? I did. What was the turnout at uh, DrupalCon this year? Uh, it was pretty cool. It was uh, about 3,000 people total. Um, I'm not sure the exact turnout to my talk, but it was pretty packed, so that was cool. Um, talked a little bit about Formalize and uh, a little bit about the jQuery desktop. There's just a kind of fun to see if I could do it desktop in a browser. Um, so it was good. I talked about um, why you should namespace your JavaScript and not have a bunch of global functions sitting out in the global namespace. Um, it, was, it was pretty cool. I'm hoping they'll have the video posted soon and uh, let you guys know if they do. So what got you into Drupal? Um, actually it was my friend Matt Farina who does a lot of work in Drupal and works for Palantir.net they do big Drupal projects he said uh, there's going to be a design for Drupal kind of a camp in Boston at MIT and you should really come speak and I was like dude I know nothing about Drupal and I'm not sure if I want to use it and he said well you know just come and talk on 960 so I, uh, I submitted a talk and um, one of the other guys that was going to be there unbeknownst to me, had already given a talk on 960 at several Drupal camps and uh, in different countries and so forth. So he said, hey, do you want to just like come partner with me and pretty much read off my slides? And I said, yeah, that'd be great, you know. So, um, you know, it kind of came for the talk and stayed for the community. It was pretty cool. Um, once I started looking at it and wrapped my head around it, it, you know, found the theming to be pretty intuitive. So um, it's definitely not something I'd want to write myself. So, you know, as a front-end guy, any CMS that kind of helps me is a good one to me. You running 960 GS on it? Uh, yeah. So on my own side, I've got it in there. And they actually launched Drupal.org uh, based on 960, stripping out the you know the mar- the um, the CSS classes they didn't need and kind of renaming them to what they wanted. But uh, the grid is there in full effect. Boom. I guess the only thing I want to say about that just to 
plug myself for a quick second since there's uh, some loud booms going on. Uh, SwordForge.net actually runs something that's similar to 960 as well called Grid Coordinates. Grid Coordinates. A SAS project, but we talked plenty about SAS, so that was just a quick plug. But bigger in the world is uh, the world of open source as it pertains to the government. We had a post a while back called Open Government, and it was intended to essentially shine a light on opengovernment.org, which is an open source Ruby project uh, headed up by Sunlight Foundation and those good folks, which we actually had an episode on not a long time back. Seems to be a growing space. Um, there's a whole conference that uh, I'll be attending in Oklahoma City um, in May called uh, Gov2OA, which will be uh, talking a lot about open government. But uh, we had these guys on the show to talk about uh, Open Congress and some of their efforts in the Open States Project. It was really interesting to see transparency shining a light into our government and letting us see a little bit more about the uh, the gears of uh, of government and sometimes how scary that is. I think one cool thing about this is just that, you know, if you're kind of the kind of person who wants to step up, you know, maybe just learn about code, you can jump into this Rails-based project and learn a few things. There's tons of API stuff. They were pulling stuff from Google and many other sources to bring in all this data. So it's, in my opinion, visually as well as, you know, for back-end devs, it's quite a nice project to just kind of like cherry-pick from. You know, that's the cool thing about having, uh, you know, GitHub out there that has um, not only projects that you can go and fork and run yourself, but live sites that you can go and you want a feature on a site, you can con- contribute the feature and, and give it back. And if it's the patch is accepted, they'll they'll push it live. Uh, I remember, you know, Gem Cutter, which became the ru- new rubygems.org, started out that yeah. way. You know, we wanted uh, avatar support. You go and you fork it, you add the avatar support, and boom, it's up in the site in a, a couple of weeks. Boom. This podcast brought to you by Boom. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a fun project. I, I like this a lot. I'm a uh, a speech empath, so when people start using uh, phrases around me, I pick them up. So that's not always a good thing. There that's go. why I don't hang around with people with Tourette's. <laughs> Stylus. I don't know. Stylus. <laughs> this was one of yours, buddy. Oh, I know, I know, but I'm saying, you know, just in general. It's, well, here's the first thing about this is that the the CSS preprocessor world, aka SAS, less SAS JS, whatever, um, has got one more not so much a contender, but you know, contributor to the importance of preprocessing CSS. And here's the deal: if there's so many ways to preprocess um, CSS, and we're talking Compass SAS, less JS, stylus. All of these out there, it, it just belies, you know, a broken language. Something that is just begging for more power, Captain. Yeah, I think you know when CSS was created, the idea was like, well, let's treat designers with kid gloves. But I think, you know, as more and more things are shifting from web web pages and websites to web applications, you know, front end developers slash designers are wanting that that power, more of a programmatic environment. So by happenstance, Adam, you retweeted a Zeldman tweet over the weekend um, from, I guess, a year ago where he said real web devs code or real web designers code always have, always will. Um, that was the uh, the leading message in a South by Southwest panel I attended last weekend. And pretty much the same name, uh, you know, designers who can't code, no excuse. But what I found interesting, I, I went there you know, looking for you know, any hint of Compass SAS, any sort of, you know, even jQuery frameworks and things. And, you know, the skewed audience of the room, their definition of code was getting out of Photoshop and actually writing the markup. So I think there's this slider between Adobe world and what goes in the browser. And I think we've made it our mission to get more uh, developer experience into the hands of, of designers and then also you know, on the other end, try to help developers not make their pages suck as much. <laughs> I mean, there's only so much automation you can do in the SaaS slash, uh, you know, pre-processing world. But definitely, I think that um, it kind of aggravates me a little bit to see such a phenomenal designer have no idea how to make it a real web page. You know, at the end of the day, you can't teach or you can't, um, you know, program um, 
things like white space and vertical rhythm with your topography and color theory and some of these things, like even the white space thing, 960 does a great job of, of giving you a groove, but it still takes a human eye to, to figure out, you know, the elements of a good design. I guess what frustrates me is curmudgeonly designers that don't want to learn new tools and would rather uh, command C, command V their way, you know, just brute force to a new design instead of working a little faster and putting more brain waves, as you said earlier, on the actual design itself. So I, I mostly agree with that, but I'll I'll play devil's advocate for a second here. Um, I've worked with people that are phenomenal designers that do know how to code, and it translates to, as a front-end developer, if you are handed a design they've done, you know, it's super easy to slice it up because they know the medium and they're designing for what's uh, what's possible and what you can accomplish. I've also worked with guys that are amazing designers, understand everything about typography and white space and texture and so forth, who would be the first to tell you that they, they don't code. And some of those, though, really challenging to translate into code when you are handed that type of design is actually kind of fun because here's somebody that's not designing with constraints in mind at all. And it was uh, not only challenging, but fun to bring that to fruition as a web page you know, in the browser and say, look, there's no compromise on the design at all. But man, I really had to think kind of, how am I going to make some of these things work? Because the person handing me the design didn't um, put place any code constraints on themselves. Yeah, I've heard that argument in the past. I guess I just, I've seen people that have pulled off both extremely well, not, and they're rare. Elliot J. Stocks being one of them, but you know that that really get both ends of it. So I guess I'm just I'm not sold on the idea that um, you're mutually exclusive. That you can be a a great designer and suddenly if you start learning the uh, the develop development medium that you know things are going to fall out of your head or you start putting artificial constraints on on your design. Yeah, I think it would definitely behooves any purely visual designer to learn more about the medium they're working in, whether that be knowing paper weight and, you know, the the stock of what's going to be printed or, you know, in our, in our case, how it's going to translate into the web. I think that's the biggest one. You know, I, I've worked with a lot of really, really gifted print designers. Um, and, you know, I got, I started cutting my teeth in print design years ago. Um, but working with those guys, if they don't understand, as you say, the medium, they don't understand, you know, something so basic as browser width and, and screen size, screen resolution, then it's just very hard to translate even what they do know in, of design into that new medium. You know, one of the most best that I know of, at least, print designers turned web developer. Sorry, web designer. Correct myself there. But uh, his name um, is Mike Coos, works at Carsonified. And I'm sure that you guys will echo this whenever I shut up. But he's uh, by far one of the best print designers turned web designer that I, I just adore his, his designs. Yeah, I think, you know, when you have that background, you know, or, you know, take somebody like Jason Santa Maria too, that went to school for design, has, you know, done the letterpress, knows, you know, the medium through and through and the history behind every typographical decision he makes, you know, I think that does translate into the web. And, you know, somebody like, um, like you were, you're saying that can, it gives you a depth, a richness to what you produce that you probably wouldn't see if you didn't have that type of background. I always feel like a hack when I try to do any type of grunge or textured background. I'm like, I, I can do it, but I never feel like, I always feel like I'm trying to pass it off. I'm like, does this look grungy enough? Because I, I don't know. So this entire conversation kind of popped up around Stylus, which was one of the latest creations of LearnBoost. We've covered, I don't know, when, how many LearnBoost projects have we covered? Uh, LearnBoost and uh, even TJ on his own. Yeah. But uh, Stylus has a beautiful homepage, so the next question I have for you, and which is sort of loaded, is how does Stylus' homepage stack up against the top 10 reasons why I won't use your open source project? I feel like I need to set a big fat caveat on that. Um, if you read the first paragraph of the post, it was in the snarky as the link bait headline proved to be, but uh, hey, it did drive some traffic. I was happy with that. Mm -hmm. Just some pointers. Well, people don't read on the web. People don't read. They read headlines and they retweet. You know, and uh, even Doctor Nick, when we had him on the show a couple of shows ago, he's like, "You know, I read the first couple." Um, but I always, uh, you know, am suspect of somebody that's <laughs> tweeting me when his wife's having a baby too. So I doubt he was actually reading the the post. But ten things that you can do to, um, you know, get the word out about your uh, open source project. 
So not necessarily a litmus test. So it's funny is we've had loads of mail at ping at the changelog.com. If you would like to submit name and town, name and town, if you wish to opine, um, you know, top 10 reasons of submitting your, uh, or to promote your, uh, your open source project. It, it's funny. We get submissions now that say, you know, here's my, my 10 point checklist. And I think you'll find that I meet all of these criteria. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, it's not, I mean, I appreciate you started it. You the movement, dude. I guess. Yeah, you get like 200 points for spelling your name right on the SAT, yes. right? There you go. Read me. There you go. <laughs> so it's not meant to be a uh, a filter. What it is is meant to guide you in some just practical things that you can do to expose the world to your great open source project. Because, you know, we, we scratch a scratch on a scratch on open source, and we just can't can't cover it all. We're drinking from this fire hose, and we, we pick up things that interest us. And for the, the guys out there that say that we cover too much Ruby and JavaScript, well, you know, if you know Python, hey, contribute. Or in this case, uh, uh, this episode's uh, big, gigantic gorge of SAS talk and front end talk. Yeah, this is uh, the changelong design edition is what this one's going to go yeah. out as. But nonetheless, this 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 post was. Uh, I've been talking with John Long about Serve. He was on the last podcast with us, oh five uh, two. But you know, we actually took this list and started comparing um, what we want Serve's homepage to be in comparison to what this is, and just does the project add up. So I think this truly does have some legs. And you're right, the people don't read the the headline totally. You know, painted the world for this post. Not that. It's not creditable, but it certainly gave it a lot of legs and sort of controversy and sort of conversations. But I honestly think that this is extremely helpful. Well, if you're not turning anybody off, you're not turning anybody on, I guess, is the yeah. the, the takeaway. So I'm, I'm glad that, you know, a couple of folks at least uh, have sent me private messages that, you know, they went out and created a, a homepage for their project just after reading those posts, which uh, makes me happy. I'll be even happier if they use a 960 grid system on said <laughs> said post so well actually um you know I, at the time you wrote that post formalize was out there it was on github it had multiple library support or whatever but there's no home page so that's kind of what spurred me to make a home page for it there you go you know and it, here's the last point on that and the reason i said this and i actually had a, a tweet back and forth with ryan bates who runs the excellent most excellent railscast.com so if you came into the the rails community after he uh he started that i'm sure that you cut your teeth on those awesome uh screencast where he walks you through different parts of rails but you know uh we were going back and forth on on hacker news where he said um basically i, I don't buy into the whole seo argument of why you need a homepage for your your project because you know i searched for can can which is one of his projects and you know it's a ordinary term right it's a dance right former theater and yet his github project is the first um hit on google but my retort was you know that's true, but then you have to know what you're searching for. But if I search for Ruby authorization, which is what CanCan provides, the only hit on the first page of Google is a blog post, not written by him, but is outlining how much they love CanCan. That's really what the change log's doing. Um, we, we're doing nothing but shining a light on other people's projects, right? We're just trying to expose the great work that you, the listeners, are doing. And so... Uh, Part of how we do that is we take your project, we take your witty yet poorly SEO'd project description, and we turn it into a sometimes a link bait headline. If we can work HTML5 in there, it works really well. Speaking of which, HTML5 boilerplate was just hit 1.0 and was updated today. Boom. Paul Irish needs to come on the show. I saw him at South by Southwest. He's promised. So... Um, We'll have to start turning the screws on that. To put that into, what was that uh, .ly service we use for getting Salvatore? <laughs> no, probably not. It might not even be up at this point. That whole domain's Libya. Oh, that's true. But just to complete the thought on that, what we're doing is just you know pointing uh, traffic at your project, and then you know over time, of course, your GitHub project is going to be the number one hit for your project on, on Google, and that's the way we want it. We just want people to know about your project. So to add some weight to that argument, I just did a search for formalize, and other than the definition inline, you know, from the dictionary.com, the number one result is my blog post, and then number four down is formalize me. And if you search for form CSS, mine's number six. So there you go. Great points. You need to blog about page. your stuff too. That's excellent point. And I just, I mean, I love how you you owned a word of the English language. 
<laughs> I'm just going to take, you know, ordinary word. I'm going to make a project out of it. And I will be number one in page rank. Well, to be fair, I did search and make sure that nobody else had a project by that name. Did you really? It, yep. It's like the uh, new trademark search for open source stuff, you know? Uh, What's funny is that uh, there was a Java library called jQuery before John Resig made it into a JavaScript library. And I think they had to like change their name or kill the project or something. But I mean, there's no way you're going to find that one now when you search. You know, it's funny. It's, I come across uh, repos all the time on GitHub that, you know, uh, formerly so-and-so because there was uh, this other project out there, right? We even talked about that in, uh, you know, Hudson that became Jenkins. The word, uh, the uh, name they wanted was Alfred. There was already that uh, Alfred app, which you like, Nathan. Yeah, it's awesome. Basically, Quicksilver on steroids. Quicksilver on steroids or as, uh, <laughs> was it, I think it was Brandon Mathis was talking about how, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, I guess Alfred was a tricycle and Launch Bar was a uh, motorcycle with a rocket pack. Launch Bar is my I don't, favorite. I don't want a rocket pack. I just need something getting me quickly from point A to point B, just locally. Well, Alfred's not uh, open source, but since we're talking about it, I use Launch Bar. And the only reason I haven't switched is because I like to hit Command Alt uh, Return, which basically gives me the last 25 um, clipboard. History, basically. And that's the only reason I don't move because I love – I use so much my clipboard history, especially if you're like copying and pasting code or um, you're writing something and you kind of need to go back in history with what you copied. It's It's been really nice for me, like tons of stuff. Yeah, I've got the same shortcut wired up to command slash. I get my clipboard history. It's really, really cool. Yeah. You, so you use LaunchBar as well? I am a launch bar guy. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, and the only reason I think it's because it came with Mac Heist, which uh, was the precursor to the new App Sumo. Have you guys seen all these deals? Yeah. That's where we got our Changelog sticker mule stickers. <laughs> <laughs> so the show did have a sponsor. <laughs> oh, actually, no, we paid them money. But uh, <laughs> Sticker Mule, if you're listening, we know that you're fans of the show because um, uh, I have a tweet to back that up. Um, we would love it. Must be one true. We're holding you to it. Cool. That's it for this special design edition of the changelog. Do you want to throw in that one last thing, which is how to style Firefox specifically? Oh, dude, we can put I that in the show notes. That. So yeah, just like, you know, what was the other thing that we learned about, um, the group and console? Who knows how long that's been out in the, in WebKit or, or uh, Firebug. Firebug, yeah. You know, we've been doing this for years, and you, you learn something new every day. You found out a way to target Firefox today without adding a class to the HTML or body tags. Yeah, so don't go overboard with this, but if you need to do slight tweaks, you can say at dash moz document space URL dash prefix with parentheses, and you can pass in your URL, or you can leave it blank, and it'll just apply to whatever page it happens on. And then within there, you just put your styles like span color black, font weight, whatever, bold. So we'll have a little, uh, we'll have a link to that in the show notes and uh, a gist probably. And as my wife would say, as my wife would say, yet you've never picked up any chicks with these skills. <laughs> Says who? True. <laughs> but Except it's the skills her. that pay the bills. That's true. I'm going to steal that bit of yours as you might like to know them. Food, shelter, and clothing. Yup, yup. That's it for a special design edition of the Changelog. Thanks, Mr. Nathan Smith, for joining us. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Cool. And we'll see you next time.